All righty, folks, we need to talk about Fed Day. We could talk about the interest rates. We could talk about the pain building in the real estate market and a massive funding gap that stretches way back to 2018. We're going to talk to somebody who called it and called it early with me and actually executed by selling early, Mr. Jonathan Twomley. How you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Michael. How are you? Um, and I'm doing very, very well. We will close with the article that both of you and I are referencing, talking about the funding gap, because it will just it will it will be the receipts that you and I actually executed on later. But let's talk about Fed Day. We just got Fed Day. Jerome Powell and team did what they were going to do, which basically was a big nothing. They were going to make some big threats about what's coming. And 10 year note, I don't know if you saw it, is down again. I think it's down at like 4.64. It was just over 5%. What's going on, Jonathan? Yeah, well, so the Fed didn't raise rates, which I think everybody in the world kind of anticipated was going to happen. I, I don't think there was anybody out there calling for a hike for this, this meeting. Um, the Fed's kind of in a wait and see position. And I think it's probably a good thing. I, I, you know, there's always lag with interest rate hikes. And I think they've They've hiked fast and they've, they've hiked aggressively. And I think it's time to just wait and see what uh, what the effect of it all is. It's certainly wreaking havoc in real estate world, as we know. I, I, I That was the one comment, because I thought Jerome Powell was kind of like predictable yesterday in his press conference mm -hmm. in the Q&A. But he let slip kind of in the middle of the Q&A when he talked about real estate, kind of indicating that the early data was worse than expected. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, ooh. Maybe my call of 3.8 million existing home sales is low or high. I, I don't know. So it, it that was the one thing in all of the press conference that was like news to me. Everything else was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the big bad wolf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Threat about December. You're done, dude. You're not doing anything. But I don't know. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. I mean, but listen, if the, if the, if the, if the 10 year is coming down as a result of this, then, I mean, there's going to be a lot of real estate people celebrating a lot, right? Because- you know, we're going to talk about the funding gap in a minute, which is a huge problem for people. But the biggest problem really has been the inability to get your head around where interest rates are going. And it just prevents right. underwriting. Like at the end of the day, when you're buying a deal, it's not that you don't care what interest rates are, but the the, the market ought to adjust to accommodate the interest rate. So mm -hmm. you're going to, you know, if interest rates are higher, you're going to pay less. You don't really care as long as you hit your numbers. It just makes it easier when interest rates are lower because this makes it easier for the sellers to sell. Right. right. Uh, yeah. But if you've got, as we know, there's going to be distressed deals coming up. There are deals out there that people have to sell for one reason or another. There are deals out there that have no debt on them. Right. So this isn't even an issue for people. The people, you know, a lot of the mom and pops who have owned this property for years, they've got no debt or they got very little debt. It really doesn't, unless they've gone and maxed out the refinancing, you know, which some people do, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know, they're not, debt is not an issue for them. So um, there are going to be deals on the market and these deals are going to start to, I think, trade more yeah. as soon as we have some more certainty on interest rates. So yeah. if you can underwrite your, the problem that's been, you know, for the last year, it's just been very difficult to underwrite a deal because you don't know what your exit cap rate is, but you just didn't know how far interest rates were going to rise. Well, that's and why I like buy and hold. <laughs> just buy it all. I don't need to do value add. I don't need to have an exit to repay folks. It's, you know, buy and hold doesn't, it doesn't suck. Well, yeah. I mean, listen, this is, this is, I like buy and hold too. And I started out as a long-term investor, even doing syndications. I told people mm -hmm. up front, look, this is a 10 year deal, mm -hmm. right? We're not going to do crazy stuff. We're not going to be doing refinances and all sorts of things like that. Just you know, put your money in. It's going to earn you a return and we're just going to sit there fat and happy. You know, the problem right. was that that at, at some point, people just started offering more, me more money than I thought the properties were worth. Yeah. So well, that's real. that's that's why we sold. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, I sold too. I sold my apartment buildings in 19. I've admitted it a couple of times I lost about a million bucks selling early. Uh, but as I've said repeatedly, given the data I had at the time, I'd sell again. I'd yeah. Sell again. No, I mean, we've had this conversation before. The thing that made us, quote unquote, lose money was this thing out of left field that nobody anticipated, right? It wasn't yeah. it wasn't like mistiming the market or making the wrong call. It was that the you know the world went nuts a year later and yeah. or something uh, you know a black swan event that nobody anticipated. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's different, right? That's different from just Yeah, that's that's why I feel okay about it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's like, hey, 
you know, but, uh, but you know, I know. sold at six and a half caps and they went to four, four and a half. That's never happened in Fresno, right? Yeah. Fresno is a B C market. Yeah. It's like, oh, wow, same, crazy. same for me in South Carolina. Right. I mean, I sold, I think I was selling in the, in this, that's in the six cap range and, and I had bought in the eight cap range. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah. um, and you know, at the time it was it was pretty stable around six to it. It wasn't it wasn't like it was like trending down, 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 down. You yeah. kind of hit a floor around yeah. six. And nobody thought interest rates were really going to go any lower at that point. It was only because of COVID yeah. that I mean, when the floor dropped out of interest rates that that you know people went. And nuts. it stayed there for two years. That was the rub. That's even the rub in residential. It wasn't their rates went to zero, it's that they stayed there for two years. Right. That right. is how the Fed broke housing. That's how I lost a million dollars selling early. But let's yeah. flip the script because I think, again, I think the Fed is done. They're going to be the big bad wolf. They're going to say scary things. And they're going to do freaking nothing. And for the record, they're not cutting either. They're yeah. just done. Oh, yeah. We're at the terminal rate. Yeah. I'm not saying this a what, cut's coming. Yeah. This is what you and I have both said for quite some time. Is that, is that they, you know, Fed is not cutting interest rates. They're going to get to a point that they that they want to get to and they're going to stay there. And then Longer the only reason they're going to cut is if there's some kind of major calamity, right? They're not, they're, they may, if they, if there's a mild recession, they may, they may be like, Hey, here's your quarter point or whatever. Maybe. maybe. I don't even think they do that, but maybe. Yeah. I, I, I'm a believer that they will do some kind of lip service, but I, I don't think they're going to do any kind of major cutting because they just don't want to put themselves back in the position that they just finally emerged from after, exactly. after 13, 14 years. Right. So yeah. the, there's not going to be any, any cuts coming up folks, but that, but that's it's good if you're buying like we have stability we know you can underwrite a deal and and frankly at interest rates where they are right now you know for multifamily like agency debt in um major metros you know like you're still talking like in the sixes right and historically it's good right yeah, yeah. i mean yeah it's just going to it's going to be a market where the financial engineers bust out yeah and yeah. the operators win and i am very cool. happy to see that I mean, listen, this is, this is, it's, I mean, since we're kind of riffing today for mm -hmm. a while, we have a little time to kind of go off in this tangent, but we're talking about financial engineering. So like I'm in the middle of redoing my, my signature multifamily investment program right now. Mm -hmm. And it's been really interesting kind of going back through it and re-recording it and updating it to kind of see what I said four years ago when I, the last time I did it. Right. right. And, and I, I'm glad to say a lot of the stuff that I said in the course that I predicted all came to, to fruition, right? But mm -hmm. especially about sort of the market peaking and what happens when interest rates go up and all that sort of stuff, right? And this is the things that people should be watching out for. The the um, but one of the things that just sort of really struck me was a, around this whole idea of financial engineering, right? Because that is the thing that kills everybody every time the market turns, right? Exactly. It happened in the Great Financial Crisis. It just happened now. I mean, you and I are, you know, weren't so active in the previous real estate crisis in the '80s because we were too young. But I'm sure that's what happened then. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether it was multifamily or whether it was single family or anything else. Yeah. The thing that kills everybody is the debt, right? Always the debt. Yep. The okay. last time around, it was too. The leverage was too high. That's what, so. This time they tried to fix it, but of course, you know, it's like, it's like, you know trying to hold on to water right like they yeah. can't they when when prices got crazy then banks came up with you know interest only loans and then people a lot of people switched into variable rate debt you know which was always yeah. there it was like variable rate debt this is the point i wanted to make variable rate debt is always it's always been around and it's always been a tool and people used it judiciously because yeah. if, if the they right were, reasons right the right, the right reason they weren't, they weren't they weren't using it to make the deal work they were using it because like, hey, I know I want to sell this property in three years, so I need more flexibility and I'll buy myself a rate cap. But we're, where when rates are stable, that's fine. That's a fine bet. Or you might even have a like a plausible reason to believe that rates are going to drop. And and so you're actually going to you know be in the money on your on your rate cap. Right. But the problem that with the last especially 2022 was that people were doing variable rate debt, not because of the flexibility, not using it as a tool, but just to try to make the deal work, to shave off a couple of points of, 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 of interest rate, just to get a little extra return. 
And when you're yeah. doing that, when you're using funky debt in order to make the deal work or you're using extra leverage to make the deal work, that's when you're setting yourself up for complete disaster should anything change, right? And and so, you know, when when the whole, you know, uh, two years ago when people were buying, doing variable rate debt, interest rate caps, you know, on a large size deal, people were paying like $30,000. A year later, they were paying a million dollars for a rate yeah. cap, right? Yeah. Which is, that should have been a signal to people like, yeah. hey, don't do the deal, right? Yeah. yeah, so what? You can raise the million dollars to pay for the rate cap. Like, don't- Next year? What about next year? What about yeah, the year exactly. after? Exactly. What, what about when this expires and everybody just like kicked the can down the road? And, you know, so, but it's always the debt. It's always the yeah. debt that keeps people. Well, let's let's flip over to this funding gap because I, uh, you know, we've I've done a fair amount of talking about the 2020, 2021 vintage bridge debt, two-year IO, you know, one-year extensions starting to blow up. I've actually had people who are now raising distressed funds on the channel. You know, one of the gentlemen out of, I think it was St. Louis, might have been Minneapolis, talked about he, he's evaluated $600 billion in deals and he thinks only about uh, 20% can be saved. Yeah. And, and by saved, meaning the LPs get something. That means right. the 80% of the deals he evaluated, LPs are going to get zero, um, yeah. which was kind of frightening. But this article we just talked about, the funding gap, actually goes back to, and I, I I will admit to smiling when I read this, but the funding gap is reaching all the way back to 2018 vintage so deals. That, yeah, that, so that was, so let's explain what the funding gap is. I mean, this is basically the idea that you can't refinance your 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 five-year debt, essentially. This is what they're talking about. You can't exactly. refinance your, five, your five-year debt for the original amount of the loan, right? So Even the loan's been paid down. Right, you've yeah, had five right. years yeah. of principal pay down, and you still can't refi. Yeah, even with some amortization, right? You have mm -hmm. you're still. I mean, part of it is because there's always that gap. You know, you can buy at seventy five percent left, but you can only refinance at seventy percent. But yeah, but you know, over five years, you're supposed to have enough NOI growth that yeah. you can pick up that gap, right? And so, what the problem is though that even if people have had the NOI growth, and if you bought in two thousand eighteen and you didn't have NOI growth, you don't know what you're like. You did something. Yeah. Wrong. Something's wrong. Something's but, wrong. Um, but you know, there's also, I mean, in some places there is, say, Florida and Texas, where insurance went through the roof and property taxes mm -hmm. went through the roof. Like that was kind of beyond people's control. But still, the, um, you know, it's really about the interest rates and the interest rates going up that much, combined with that, you know, that delta of seventy five percent to seventy percent, uh, means that people can't refinance. Now, you and I have been talking about this with. The crazy, you know, stuff that happened over the last couple of years. But the thing that just really kind of, you know, I, I don't want to say I was happy. I was surprised. I was a little. I felt a little bit gratified in the sense that, like, I made the right call. Oh, I, 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 I I'll, I'll say it. I was, I was happy. I was like, I sold for a reason. I knew yeah. it was nuts. I lost a million bucks, but it was still the right call. I, I was, I smiled when I read that. Well, yeah. I mean, so I, I just felt like, okay, I. Maybe I know what I'm doing after all. <laughs> Maybe I know because, what I'm doing. You know what you're doing. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, people were telling me I was nuts to be selling in 2019. Mm -hmm. But yep. um, the point is that this, so back in the 20, so 2018, 2019, 2020 vintage deals before things went crazy, mm -hmm. there's still the funding gap, which is pretty shocking, actually. I mean, given that five years have passed, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I know that, you know, I was looking at um, some of the indices the other day for multifamily, and we're kind of back down to 2019 pricing, you know, which is still uh, like high pricing, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's still, yeah. it's people have made, the, multifamily has increased a lot in value since the beginning of the last cycle, right? So right. it's still very high value, but the problem is it's just dropped so much in the last, from stuff that was bought at the peak, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And even and even past that. So if you're back to if you're back to 2019 values, then you can't refinance a 2018 deal. No. At, if you're refinancing at 75 percent or 70 percent, I'm sorry, you can't get those proceeds out, right? No. So Ca cash in refi. I mean, remember, I think it was a year ago, might have been 10 months ago. I told you about a conversation I had with one of my bankers, right? Yeah. Remember, I bring in my PFS. Yeah. He has this middle of folder. We do our song and dance. We're good. He points at the folder and says, "I can't refi half of those." Yeah. Right. Cash. Cause it's, I'm telling you cash in refi is cash in refi for 2018 vintage. You thought you were safe. 
Yeah. Nope. I mean, not safe. So I think a lot of those deals will come to market though, right? Because no, those that, will be sold. Exactly. Yeah. Those will be yeah. Sold. I mean, those are the ones where people will not, you know, their capital won't be impaired. They might even make a little bit of money. On maybe those a little. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. But the, um, you know, like they're not, they're not making what they expected to make. No, no. It's a, yeah. yeah. So I think the LPs and those are certainly 90 cents on the dollar, if not a hundred cents, probably a hundred cents, but you know, maybe there's some transaction costs or whatever, but yeah, it, it was, it was really interesting to see. Cause I, you know, as we've talked about, we, we both felt like maybe we sold early, but when yeah. I read that article the other day, I'm like, wow, 2018 deals require cash in refis. Woo. I'm glad I sold. I mean, listen, I didn't feel like I sold early in 2020, right? No, I, mean, I didn't. When, pe when people were sweating bullets about like- Rent none collection of their, and stuff. Yeah, none of their tenants paying them rent or whatever. I like remember. I was feeling quite happy that I had sold. But, you know, so it's only it's only like that little, that FOMO from 21, yeah. 22, that where I felt like, ah, oh, man, if I just held on a little longer. I mean, I've never sat down and, you know, Stuck the needle in my eye by calculating how much it would have made. <laughs> I did. I did it's, the math. I wasn't happy. Don't do it. It's not good. Don't do it. It's I'm bad. sure it's it. at least a million dollars, if not yeah. more, that I would have made if I just held on to those properties. But yeah. You know, well, I, you know, there's a couple of good things to kind of spin this around is uh, kind of you brought it up already. Right now, there's not a lot of deal flow, right? The yeah. buyers and sellers aren't agreeing. But now, if we're seeing 2018 vintages requiring cash in, or, or capital calls, they want to keep it. It might be the start of inventory coming to the market being priced appropriately. And also one of the things to close on is um, Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank. I forget his name. Kevin O'Leary. O'Leary, yeah. Yeah, O'Leary's talking about commercials seeing three years of pain. I originally thought it would only be 18 months. It would be quicker, but I think he's right. I think a lot of extended pretend, a lot of this is going on. So uh, I think the opportunity in commercial, both multifamily office and others, is just starting. We're in the we're definitely in the first inning, and this might be an extra inning game. Um, so that's encouraging to me. And maybe I'll get another bite at the apple. I'll ten thirty one out of homes into apartments again. Um, so what do you think about the timeline? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be especially for I think office and stuff. But you know what I'm really curious about, and I, I just I'm just throwing this out there because I don't know if you look at if you look at the indices. Uh, over the last for the last cycle, right? <clears throat> One of the things that really stands out is just how much self storage and mul and uh, mobile homes appreciate yeah. in that cycle. I right? saw that too. Multifamily was up by by quite a bit, but it was like I think multifamily values at the peak were maybe sixty or seventy percent over the mm -hmm. previous peak, right? But but um, gee, I mean, mobile home parks and self storage, like two and a half times, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Just, and so, and obviously, I think some of some of that is won't be handed back because some of that is just people realizing that those were actually good assets to own, yeah. right? They've been disfavored before. Yeah, under so, undervalued, underappreciated. Yeah, so under more money came yeah. in, like understanding those assets yeah. as opposed to thinking of, of, of them as being strange and weird and risky. Yep. However, um, with that much appreciation, regression right, to the mean is a bitch. Yeah, and and plus, I mean, not I know for you know mobile home parks, one of the things that's apparently attractive is that you know they're they're not the 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 um, quantity is decreasing, right? Because yeah, they're being replaced. Approves new ones anymore, yeah. right? But right. but for self storage, I mean, I don't know what it's like in Fresno, but in New York City, I mean, the amount of self storage that I saw going being built around everywhere. Here, yeah. Everywhere yeah. because everybody's piling in because of the the yeah. returns on it. And yeah. you got to wonder if that's not overbuilt too. And I haven't seen anything about, you know. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, I've got to go. Where can people find you, please? All right. Well, a couple of places if you would like to. So we're closing the deal tomorrow. If you want to get in on the next one, uh, just Google True Bridges Asset Management and uh, for, fill out the investor form that you find there. If you would like to get in on my new revised course on multifamily investing, that will be available in the next few weeks. You can just come to apartmentinvestorsclub.com, download the free download there and get on my email list and you'll find out all about it as soon as it's released. Very cool, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Thank you.